Okay, so I will talk about uh, uh, time geometry in Hatch theory. Um, okay, so the plan of the talk today is there will be uh, almost no proof, so it will be kind of a survey of what I want to uh, explain later. So I will start by a review of uh, time geometry, and then I will explain uh, the main questions and some of the results in Hatch theories that you can get out of it. Okay, so uh, let me start with uh, time geometry. Okay, so first uh, about the ID. So uh, I think uh, it was first mentioned by uh, Grotendieck uh, in Esquisse d'un Programme in uh, 84. Um, and there he argues that uh, general topology was invented by analysts uh, for the use of uh, analysis, but not for studying uh, the natural uh, topological properties of uh, natural geometric forms and so that it should be replaced by some kind of uh, tame topology. And uh, so uh, what is the basic idea? The basic idea is you want to discard uh, pathologies, let's say a wild topological phenomena. So let me give some examples. So of course, you don't want to have cantor sets or uh, piano curves of this kind of thing. But uh, much more basically, uh, you want to uh, discard some kind of uh, usual monsters. So what is a usual monster? I guess the best example is given by uh, take gamma to be the graph of x give uh, sine 1 over x for x a positive real number. Then, of course, you have this uh, 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 picture of uh, accumulation to the interval, uh, vertical interval uh, 0, 1. So, uh, gamma is not tame for at least three reasons. Uh, so, what are the uh, main reasons? First, if you look at the closure, uh, gamma bar of this graph in R2, uh, then uh, you get this vertical segment uh, 0, 1, and then uh, you have gamma. So this is the boundary of gamma. And uh, well, this is bad because uh, this is uh, connected, but not arc connected. So if you believe that uh, real geometry has something to do with drawing curves, then this is some kind of thing that you don't want to have. So uh, concerning the world boundary, actually, someone remarked to me that there are different notions. Okay, so I do not define it. So let's say this is definition of boundary of gamma. Yeah, it's just in this very special case. No, I agree. Yes, closure minus interior, if you want. Yeah, but it's not. Okay. <laughs> so uh, whatever. So Alpha will complain because I do not give a definition of a dimension in this setting, but I think this is very intuitive. So if you look at the dimension of the boundary, so this is this uh, vertical segment. So clearly this is dimension one, whatever the definition you use. But then uh, this is also the dimension of gamma. And so it's well known that if you have this kind of properties, you cannot have any good uh, stratification theory. So this is bad. So no stratification theory. And really, this idea of having a stratification is the main uh, argument developed by Grotendieck uh, in his Esquisse d'un Programme. And uh, much more basically, you can just uh, look at gamma intersected with the real axis. Right? And then uh, you see that morally, this is a dimensional zero object, but it's an infinite collection of points. And uh, so this means that in some sense, this is not of finite type. And so you don't want to have this. So this is a kind of heuristic. You don't want to have uh, uh, these kind of properties. Uh, these are no uh, good uh, objects. OK, so uh, what is the prototype of tame geometry in the mind of uh, Grothendieck? Uh, the prototype. Uh, is semi-algebraic geometry. Semi-algebraic, let me uh, just write SA for semi-algebraic geometry. 
So notice that uh, we are doing uh, geometry over R, R here, right? So uh, I'll remind you the definition just to fix ideas. Everybody knows it. But so I remind you that if you take a subset of Rn, then uh, it is semi-algebraic if it is a finite union of basic blocks of the form x in Rn such that uh, f of x is equal to 0 and gi of x is larger than 0 for a finite collection uh, of functions gi, which are polynomials with f g1 gk in r of x1, xn. OK? And so uh, why is that considered as being a, a, a good uh, category? Well, what are the same properties of uh, semi-algebraic sets? Well, if x is semi-algebraic, then uh, you don't have this kind of pathologies in the sense that if you just define uh, the boundary this way, x bar minus x, then this is still semi-algebraic. Uh, the dimension. Well, of course, I should define precisely the dimension, but here this is very intuitive again. It's strictly smaller. Uh, the number of connected components. Ah, OK. I will never discuss the empty set here, OK? I don't want to enter this kind of problem. I know this is not a serious problem, OK? You agree with me about that. So you have only finitely many uh, connected components. So this is an important finiteness property. And uh, any connected component, OK, let's put it here just for offer. Then uh, any connected component of x is also semi-algebraic. So you have this kind of uh, stability property by taking uh, connected components. OK, so uh, this is nice. But uh, the problem is that uh, this is too rigid. This is too close to usual algebraic geometry to be really useful to do uh, new things in some sense. And so we would like uh, more general and more flexible uh, uh, tame geometries. And uh, in fact, uh, those other tame geometries were developed exactly the same year as uh, Grotendieck published his uh, manifest, namely, uh, so model theorist. Uh, developed uh, tame geometries uh, exactly the same year. So basically, there are two papers, one by uh, Van den Dries, um, where he defined uh, structures of finite type. And the same year, uh, Pillay and Steinhorn where they defined uh, ominimal structures. And this is now the accepted uh, terminology. So this is the one I will use. And these are uh, essentially equivalent. So ominimal structures And the idea of model theorists is uh, to have an axiomatic approach. right? So you uh, start with the properties that you want. And then you prove after that that uh, such tame geometries, uh, uh, interesting such tame geometries do exist. OK, so uh, there are two ways of presenting uh, ominimal structures, one from model theory, which is, in fact, the most efficient one, and the other one, which is the geometric one. First, I'm not an expert in model theory. And second, it would take a long time to uh, uh, write uh, all the definitions. So I will not do that. Uh, so I will uh, choose the geometric presentation. So let's do that. So I'll remind you a few things about structures first, and then I will talk about uh, ominimal ones. So what is the definition of a structure? So a structure expanding R uh, is a collection S equal uh, Sn for each uh, integer n where Sn is a subset of the power set of Rn, uh, satisfying the uh, following properties. So 
So uh, the first property that you want is that uh, the algebraic set of Rn are in Sn. Second is that you want uh, that uh, Sn uh, in P of Rn is a Boolean subalgebra. That means that uh, you are stable, i.e. stable, and the union, finite unions, finite intersections, and complement. Okay. Uh, so you see that up to now there is uh, this axiom two is pure set theory. The third one, too, you want stability on the product. So if A is in SP and B in SQ, then you want A times B to be in SP plus Q. Okay. And then the fourth axiom is the geometric one. You ask that you are stable under linear projection. So if P from Rn plus 1 to Rn is a linear projection, and uh, if A belongs to Sn plus 1, uh, then you want that uh, P of A uh, is in Sn. OK, so this is the definition of a structure. Uh, this is just a collection of sets you are allowed to play with. Okay. And uh, you just require those very basic uh, properties. So you don't insist only algebraic sets and not semi-algebraic sets? Yeah, but uh, by Tarsis Adenberg, because of uh, 4, you will get all the semi-algebraic. So uh, let me. So this is the definition of a structure. So additional uh, definition. So these are the bricks uh, with which you are allowed to play. So uh, the elements. So the terminology. The elements of S n uh, are called uh, S definable sets. And uh, once you have uh, the sets, uh, the spaces, uh, you have the map. So a map f from a to b uh, is said to be uh, as definable if uh, a, b, and the graph of uh, f, which is contained in a cross b, are as definable. So now you know what are the, uh, what are the uh, sets you are allowed to play with and the maps. So let me uh, give uh, uh, one example. The trivial example is uh, R alge. So, uh, well, the so definable sets are exactly the semi algebraic sets. So they satisfy all these axioms because uh, the only non-trivial axiom is 4, but this is starsky seidenberg theorem. So uh, it's well known that a linear projection of a real algebraic set is not necessarily a real algebraic because you will get some uh, inequalities, but you get exactly the semi-algebraic sets. And uh, the other remark is that this structure, by definition, because of axiom 1 and 4, is contained in any other structure. So are alge any other uh, structure. Okay. The second remark is that if you have uh, S1 and S2, two structures, then uh, S1 intersected with S2 is also a structure. I hope the meaning is clear. This means that for each n, you take S1n intersected with S2n, and then it still satisfies uh, this. And so uh, as a result, this implies that if you give yourself any collection, if f is a collection of functions, f from rm to r for different m, or of subsets, of R n m, uh, then one can define 
the structure uh, Rf uh, generated by F. Right? So this is the smaller structure such, such that in the first case all, all the functions f are definable or in the second case all the subsets uh, of your collection f uh, are definable. Okay. All right. So uh, just to uh, make a, a few comments about uh, uh, the structures, you have a few facts that are easily provable. So uh, first is that if A is S definable for S some structure, then automatically uh, the closure, the interior, and so uh, and also the boundary are definable. Um, B is that if you have F from A to B uh, S definable, then uh, F minus F of A and F minus one of B uh, are S definable. And uh, C is that S definable map can be composed. So if you have F from A to B and G from uh, B to C, uh, S definable, then uh, G composed with F is S definable. From A to C is S definable. Okay? So uh, these are easy facts, but uh, I want to give uh, the proof that uh, of this implication that A definable implies that A bar is definable so that you get some feeling of what happens, right? Otherwise, I will just give you a long list of properties. But So uh, let's consider A bar. So of course, uh, you define it as being the set, the usual uh, definition in topology. So you have quantifiers. So this is a set of x in Rn, such that for any epsilon larger than 0, there exists y in, R, uh, in A, such that uh, sum of xi minus yi uh, square is smaller than epsilon square. Okay. So it's not clear on this uh, that uh, this is definable. Uh, because uh, this is not written in the, in the terms uh, of the axioms, right? So what I want to do is to try to write this as uh, using the force axiom, the projection formula. And then you see that this projection axiom is used to uh, uh, cancel uh, uh, quantifiers. Right? To, uh, so uh, let me uh, give you the formula, and you will see that this is a pain. So uh, if you think about it, this is... Uh, the following thing. Uh, ah, now I have to erase. So I claim you can write it in this way. Uh, where, uh, what is B? Well, so you have to go to a higher dimension, of course. You take the intersection in R2 and plus 1 of uh, this product with uh, the set of x, epsilon, y in Rn cos R cos Rm uh, so that uh, the sum of uh, xi square, xi minus yi square uh, is larger than epsilon, is smaller than epsilon square. Okay. I hope my formula is correct. So you see that to, in order to uh, kill those quantifiers, uh, you use projections. But of course, uh, the formulas become very complicated. You have to go to a higher dimension. So uh, I hope this example convinces you that formulas are much better than projections. And so this is where we go to model theory. To uh, I will be very light. So. Uh, so definition. When you look at epsilon bigger than zero, it seems to me that maybe you need to put it in some form inside the, the description. That is, you have to put to use r bigger than zero somewhere in some part where it's a small detail. <coughs> you mean here? Because you you change yeah, yeah. the quantifier for every epsilon bigger than zero to. The no, but first I want a to be in a bar, so uh, I guess oh. I need this, and. Oh. But you can take for any epsilon, right? Yeah, I could take for any epsilon. 
No, no, because if you do it for oh, every epsilon, it's not true because mm -hmm. I, yeah, yeah. because epsilon. I am putting it epsilon square, so okay. Let's do it this way. No, I no, no, it's not true because epsilon equal to zero is not uh, allowed. Cannot yeah. You cannot do it with epsilon equal to zero. <laughs> sure, sure. So you must change the description in some way. Okay. I will leave it this way, and uh, you just correct it so that uh, this problem does not happen. Okay? That's okay. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have been <laughs> uh, wanting to, to say that. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, what I want to say is that you should move from this language using only projections to a uh, language of formulas. So, uh, a first, let me recall what is a first order formula. The first order formula in the language of S uh, is a formula, so this is not very precise, I'm sorry for again, but I think you get the idea, is a formula uh, constructed out of uh, the following rules. Uh, first is that if uh, you take a polynomial, with real coefficient in n variables, then uh, the sentence uh, p x1 xn is equal to zero, and uh, the sentence uh, p of x1 xn larger than zero uh, are first order formulas. Okay. Uh, second is that if r if A is an element in Sn, then uh, the sentence x belongs to A is a, also a first order formula. Uh, three is that if you have uh, two first order formulas, phi of x1, xn, and psi of x1, xn are first order formula, Uh, then uh, phi and psi, uh, ps phi or psi, uh, no phi, and uh, phi implies psi are first order formula. Okay, and uh, four is that if phi of yx is a first order formula where uh, y is uh, in Rp, is so to be in Rp and x is in Rn, then uh, if, R, if A is in Sn, then uh, the uh, sentence uh, there exists x in A uh, such that phi of yx and uh, uh, for all uh, x in A, phi of yx are also first order formulas. And now the claim is that uh, uh, any set defined by a first order formula in this language uh, will be definable. And so you see that uh, thanks to this four, uh, you are allowing uh, quantifiers on elements of sets. So, lemma. So this is easy. This is by induction on the construction of formulas. Is that uh, if phi of x1, xn is a first uh, order formula in the language uh, of S, then the set of x1, xn in Rn uh, such that phi x1, xn uh, is S definable. So basically, uh, one, two, and three are more, are more or less trivial by definition. 
uh, uh, using the axiom, so one, two, three of structures. The only non-trivial one is four, but uh, you just have to do the same kind of manipulation to write those sets uh, as, as those sentences in terms of projections. So let's use this as uh, an easy exercise. Okay, so it was a quick reminder on structure. So uh, now uh, let's wait, uh, let's stop one second. So uh, what is the non-trivial geometric axiom? This is axiom four, right? Because it tells you that if you choose a structure and in dimension 2020, you add a new set and you decree that this new set is as definable, then in all smaller dimension, in particular in dimension one, uh, you would create a new, uh, a lot of new uh, definable sets by taking linear projections of those guys, okay? And so this means, this means that uh, very fast, if you are not careful enough, then this will be pure set theory and counter sets will appear. So actually this level holds in a slightly uh, stronger form that the smallest structure containing a given connection is exactly those signature. That's connection. correct. I completely agree, but as I said, I don't want, I mean, I don't want to enter into even basic model theory, but what you are saying is completely true. Okay, so, uh, but what I want to do now is to counterbalance this wild axiom four in order to do geometry and not pure set theory, okay? So, uh, so this is a notion of uh, ominimal structures. And uh, so what is the definition? Uh, a structure S is O minimal if uh, you add the uh, fifth axiom, which is that uh, any element, any element in S1 is a finite, is semi-algebraic, namely it's a finite union of points and intervals. So for me, intervals are always not reduced to a point, okay? So you are just asking that in dimension one, there is nothing more than semi-algebraic sets. And you have infinite or non-finite intervals over. Yes. Uh, so yeah, Offer is right. You allow uh, things of this form. And uh, things of this form are allowed, okay? Uh, and so you see that uh, there is a tension between this axiom and this uh, projection axiom that creates a lot of new sets if you start from something random in high dimension. So of course, uh, we still have a trivial example, which is uh, RL. Uh, this is uh, trivially O minimum. Okay. Uh, the second thing uh, that uh, you can say is uh, a corollary of this definition. So first remark, and uh, this remark is kind of strange if you think that we want to use it to do some hot theory and maybe some uh, arithmetic geometry, is that uh, Z is never definable, is not uh, definable in any ominous structure. So it does not exist, right? Because this is an infinite uh, set, uh, an infinite union of points in R. So uh, another rem uh, second remark is that periodic functions are not allowed. Uh, periodic functions like uh, sine are not definable in an, in an O minimal structure. Right, of course. Because the pre-image of a point would be an infinite collection uh, of points again. Hmm? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Non-constant. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, one remark that I will not uh, write because I will have no use of it. Uh, I won't have time to talk about this. Is that uh, what is so special about R? Can we work with other fields, okay? And the answer is that if you want, of course, uh, there is nothing uh, here you can start basically with any <coughs> ring, this is no problem. But uh, the O minimality condition needs uh, you to have a notion of interval, okay? So the best thing to do is to start with a totally ordered ring. 
And then it's not difficult to see that if you start with a totally ordered ring and asking this uh, ominimal axiom that the ring itself should be ominimal, so satisfies this property, then you will see that uh, you, you get a real closed field. So in fact, you can replace R by any real closed field. But uh, I won't talk about that. OK, so, ah, so we have the definition. So uh, now uh, we have the definition. We have only one trivial example up to now. Uh, but let me first uh, prove uh, that, uh, or at least state, that this axiomatic axi uh, definition gives you some nice uh, tame properties. Okay. So uh, tame properties of all minimal structures. So I will state a sequence of theorem, and maybe tomorrow uh, I will give you some indication of them. They are not difficult. Everything is completely elementary here, uh, but uh, it takes time. So, so uh, the first thing that you can ask is uh, basically what is the structure of a definable function from uh, R to R. Okay? And so uh, the first theorem is called the monotonicity theorem. Monotonicity theorem. And it says the following. It says that uh, if you start from a map, uh, from an interval a, b uh, to r, which is uh, definable, ah, yeah. So now I fix s is, uh, by definition, an o-minimal structure. Minimal structure. And uh, s, and uh, definable, means s definable. So I start with uh, this uh, definable uh, map uh, in some minimal structure. And then the claim is that you can uh, conclude that there exists a finite partition uh, of this interval AB such that uh, F in restriction to the open interval AI, AI plus 1 is continuous. Is continuous and either constant or strictly monotonous. So now you feel a bit better. Uh, those functions are really very tame. You have this very nice uh, property. Uh, so one remark is that uh, you can replace uh, continuous by uh, C P of for a finite P, but not by C infinity. Of course, if you replace uh, C0 by C P, then uh, you will have to change this finite uh, subdivision. So you will have a refinement, but usually it will not be possible to go to uh, infinity. Is, is there yes, there are examples. There are examples of O minimal structures where you can't do that. So, uh, of course, they are kind of pathological from my point of view, but uh, they exist. Uh, so, this, is, this tells you what are uh, one-dimensional uh, functions. Uh, so, uh, now, uh, what about uh, higher dimension? Well, the second, um, and this is the main topological result, really, is the decomposition theorem, where I think, uh, um, no, not that one. <laughs> uh, decomposition theorem for minimal structures. So this means that if you start with a finite collection of uh, definable uh, sets uh, in Rn in some minimal structure, then uh, there exists a very strong uh, kind of decomposition. There exists a cylindrical definable cellular decomposition uh, of Rn. So I will call this a CDCD, uh, such that each AI is a finite union of cells. So you can decompose uh, the full uh, Rn, such that each AI is a finite unit of cells. So now I have to uh, explain you what is a, uh, 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 such a cellular cylindrical decomposition. So where, okay, uh, let me do this here. 
Uh, I guess I can now erase uh, the properties of structures. So uh, the definition of uh, cylindrical decomposition is by induction, because you will see what the cylinders. So for n is equal to 1, so you just have the real line. So what is the CD, CD of R? Well, this is what you think. So this is just your finite partition, A1, A2, AR, uh, in R. And uh, what are the cells? Well, the cells are just the points. And uh, 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 the, inter the open interval. Yeah, so where uh, a0 is minus infinity and al plus 1 is plus infinity with this notation. Okay, okay so this is what happens in dimension 1. You are just cutting uh, your real line in finitely many uh, intervals. And uh, so what happens in higher dimension? Well, you, uh, you work uh, by induction. So a CD, CD of Rn is a CD, CD of Rn minus 1. Plus, uh, for each cell uh, C of uh, Rn minus 1, so let's make a picture, of course, in dimension 2. So I have a cell. And uh, above that cell, I give myself uh, two functions, uh, one strictly larger than the other. Uh, so this is Fci, Fci plus 1. So Fci plus 1 is greater or equal to Fci. And so uh, what, what are uh, the cells in Rn plus 1? Well, you have the graphs of those functions, and you have the bands here. Okay? And uh, you are allowed to take only finitely many functions. I hope this is clear. I will not write everything. You give yourself finitely many functions satisfying those inequalities. And then you consider the corresponding graphs and the corresponding bands. And the function, so the function is uh, strictly uh, less than the next one. Yes. And are they continuous or something? No, not necessarily. Just definable. Yeah. But uh, of course, it will be part of the theory that you can refine the decomposition so that everything becomes uh, continuous in restriction to the cell, right? So you. Uh, so you use the monotonicity to prove this. So then you get also that the, maybe the, the band, as you say, the stripes are monotonic in some sense. And uh, you can also refine so that uh, you, you satisfy those properties, of course, yes. So you can refine so that those FCI uh, satisfy the conclusion of this monotonicity. Okay, um, what else? Is there anything else? So you see, this is a very uh, kind of very strong uh, cellular decomposition. And uh, as a corollary, what you get automatically already is that if you have a set which is definable in an O-minimal structure, then... Uh, uh, first, it has finitely many connected components, right? Because it's it's composed out of finitely many cells. So, but you need some continuity to verify the connectivity. Okay, so there is a notion of definable uh, connectivity, and but in fact, over R, uh, this would give you the same uh, usual uh, connectivity. Okay, but you're right. So, so this is not completely proven, but this is true: is that if A is definable. Uh, then uh, the number of connected components is uh, finite, and uh, any connected component of A is uh, definable in the minimal structure because it is also a finite uh, union of the self. And uh, in the same way, if you define the dimension as being the smallest, um, the largest dimension of a cell appearing in, in such a decomposition, then you uh, get uh, that uh, uh, dimension of uh, partial A is smaller than dimension of A. Okay. So once you are here, you guess that uh, you have a stratification theorem, and this is true. 
Yeah, so I'm cheating again. Uh, in fact, what you, first you have to prove that what I call the cell is really a cell in the sense that this is homomorphic in the definable category to RK for some K, any cell. And then uh, you define the dimension as being the maximal K so that you can embed definably RK inside your guy. And you prove that this is the same thing as a naive dimension in terms of cellular decomposition. And it is also the dimension in the sense of topology that are yes, different also. from metric spaces and criminal exactly. definitions. Yes. All of them coincide here, so there is no uh, problem. Okay, so what is the stratification theorem? The stratification theorem tells you that if you take some uh, guy which is definable in some minimal structure and you... Ah, okay, and uh, once more again, uh, as I said, you can... Uh, there is a notion of uh, CP. Uh, decomposition, right? Everything that you can do, you can do it C0 and then CP, and so this is no problem using the, this kind of monotony theorem. Uh, so here I will fix the P because sometimes this is important for this theorem, is that there exists a finite stratification of A and by this, I mean a you can write A as a disjoint union of strata, where a stratum, a stratum is what? This is a CP manifold, but a very particular one. This is a graph manifold. So first, it is a CP manifold. It is definable. Uh, and this is a graph of F from uh, U to Rn, uh, which is, uh, so U here is an open, uh, definable in some uh, RP, and uh, uh, F is CP, and uh, with bounded derivatives up to P. Okay, so this is a very uh, nice uh, stratification theory. And in particular, and I will use that later, uh, uh, the corollary of this uh, stratification theorem tells you that if you have uh, A in Rn, which is uh, definable in some minimal structure and of dimension uh, K, and which is bounded in Rn, then the K volume, the K Euclidean volume, uh, of A is finite. Can you prove that the community of A is finite? Uh, yes. Uh, it's, it's, this very strong uh, decomposition theorem gives you a very nice uh, simplicial decomposition, in fact. <laughs> uh, and, well, let me mention one last result to give you one more uh, tameness result, which is a uh, trivialization uh, theorem. So in the stratum, uh, it is not so clear what was the, you say it is a graph of something. Yes, it's a graph of a CP function. From RP to RN. To some open set of RP to RN. And uh, uh, this map is definable, of course. Okay, this map is in RP plus N. But do you then have to use some linear transformation or permutations of the coordinate or what? To, to put it in, uh, in... You want some kind of rectilinearization of this thing? Uh, because it's not the same n. If it is no, okay, 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 sorry. Rn plus p. Minus p. Ma yeah, minus minus, minus p. p. Sorry. And, but then you will need also to change something, because if you take the graph of y per x squared, the derivative is not bounded, so you have to take the inverse. And so you have to, to, to do a permutation of the coordinate. So, so it's, it's not... We need to, to, to be more precise in the statement. I would need if I really used it. But I guess it gives some kind of idea of what happens. So I will not try to uh, correct this. But in fact, I think um, um, OK, I will leave it like this. But I agree with you that uh, you have to be a bit careful about uh, reordering the variables. 
Okay, so uh, what is the trivialization theorem? Well, it tells you that if you have x to uh, from x to y uh, continuous and definable, then in fact you can uh, trivialize it in a uh, uh, very strong sense. There exists a partition y into yi, uh, where yi is definable. So this is a finite partition, uh, definable. Uh, such that, well, if you restrict to yi, then uh, here uh, in uh, x you have f minus 1 of yi. Uh, then this is trivialized on uh, the full yi by uh, yi cross uh, the fiber, some z, where z is definable. The yes, so uh, z is definable and this is uh, omeo definable. <laughs> yes. And of course you can do it CP if you want, but uh, you have to refine the partition. And uh, as a corollary, I will not write it because I'm already tired, is that uh, if you have a definable family, so, uh, well, uh, then uh, there are only finitely many homeomorphism type in the fibers. Okay. Using this uh, stratification, a trivialization theorem. Okay, so this is nice. This is completely axiomatic. This would be a bit sad if the only example were uh, are alge. But uh, this is not the case. So now uh, let me try to uh, say a few words on this. Uh, well, in some sense, it was already known at the time that there are all other uh, uh, kind of tame geometries, for instance, for instance uh, sub-analytic sets. So, uh, uh, so let me uh, say a few words about that. Uh, so uh, the main problem is uh, given f a collection of functions uh, when is the structure rf uh, au minimum right it's clear that if f contains a sine function, then this will not work. <coughs> but so uh, we'll just give a criterion. I will not uh, 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 say much, but uh, most proofs uh, work like this. So uh, definition, a structure S, not necessarily au minimum, is model complete. If uh, in the definition that I raise of uh, definable set, uh, the, po the operation of taking uh, complements is superfluous. And then uh, the result is uh, that uh, if a structure is model complete, then it is enough to, c to uh, constrain uh, the connecti connectivity of some very uh, specific set. So definition, an F set is uh, X in Rn such that you satisfy P of X, F1 of X, F uh, K of X is equal to zero for some polynomial p. I don't understand the definition. Uh, well, I'm not surprised because I was not very precise. So uh, by this I mean that uh, you can construct all the definable set without using complement anywhere. No, but a structure already includes everything that you can construct. It's not a structure but a collection. Okay, so I will try to be a bit more precise uh, in the theorem. I think it makes sense vaguely. 
and I will explain what I mean by that. So uh, let, me, let me start with my collection of function f, and then I define what is an f set. So these are exactly the solution of such uh, equations where p is a polynomial and the fi's are sum of my functions. Okay? And then uh, the proposition is that uh, suppose that uh, the collection uh, f satisfies that uh, Rf is a model complete and uh, two. So the way I want to say it uh, to answer uh, offer, uh, by this I mean that you start uh, with the graphs of all your functions. These are your basic definable sets. Then I can project linearly. I can take product. I can take intersection, finite intersection, and finite unions. But I do not consider out of this complements. So now does it make sense? And then, and then I say that the uh, I say that uh, the structure is model complete. If you get doing only those operations, you get all the definable sets in your structure, including the complements. Of what you including have. the complements, exactly. So this is what I mean by this uh, vague sentence. Uh, does it make sense? Yes. So suppose that uh, the, your structure satisfies that property and that each F set has finitely many components. Okay? And then uh, the structure is uh, omni minimal. Uh, in the usual topological sense of yeah, I, I'm working over R. So if you work over a real closed field, then you have to put a definable, definable notion of definable connect, connexity. But uh, here, yeah, this is fine. Uh, okay. So if you have these strong uh, uh, properties that you do not have to use uh, taking complements, and if those very peculiar sets are uh, connected, are finitely many connect components, then your structure is minimal. In fact, what you prove here is that any definable set is a projection of an F set. So in particular, if the F set uh, has finitely many connected components, then uh, its projection also has finitely many uh, connected components. And so in particular, in dimension one, you have only finitely many con connected components, and so you're done. This is important because uh, this is basically the way you uh, prove Right, the O minimality uh, of R H corresponds to the fact that uh, 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 you have elim quantifier eliminations, but this is not true for all O minimal structures. On the other hand, model complete is much weaker, and uh, this is the way you uh, uh, prove uh, things. So, uh, what are uh, uh, the examples that you can get this way? Uh, you get R N. So uh, what is Rn? This is a guy generated by uh, R, generated by the collection of restricted uh, real analytic functions. Uh, so what are those things? These are functions from uh, multi-cube to R, which are restriction of uh, real analytic on a neighborhood uh, of this cube, and uh, you extend them to Rn by putting zero outside of the cube. Okay, so let me not write much more. Then uh, what we can prove is that in this structure, so this means that you are allowed to play only uh, with real analytic functions defined on compact sets, basically. Okay. So uh, what are the definable sets? It's not hard to uh, show that the definable the R and definable sets are exactly what are called the globally subanalytic uh, sets. Uh, time is passing, and I don't want. Uh, if you have if you have questions, we can talk about the precise definition afterwards. Uh, uh, I don't want to. Uh, make a lot of reminder about semi-analytic and uh, uh, sub-analytic geometry. Um, 
So what is crucial here is uh, a Gabrielov theorem. So basically, the proof of the O-minimality uh, comes from Gabrielov's theorem, which tells you uh, exactly that the complement of uh, subanalytic is subanalytic. So uh, all this theory was developed by uh, basically uh, Gabrielov, uh, Wojciechowicz, and Ironaka. Uh, let me move to another, uh, at the time, more exciting uh, structure, which is uh, our exp. So this is just the expansion of uh, the real field by uh, the uh, full real exponential function. So the proof that this is O minimal is due to Wilkie. And uh, it uses uh, model theoretic uh, techniques uh, so let me uh, maybe say a few things. So an exponential set, so that you get an idea of what happens, uh, is a guy of the form uh, x in Rn, exactly of this form. So uh, p of x1, xn, exponential x1, exponential xn. You can take the same number of variables in this example, uh, where p is a polynomial. And a sub-exponential set is a linear projection of such a thing, P of uh, exponential sets. So Pm of an exponential set in Rm plus M. And then, uh, basically, uh, Wilkie was inspired by this Gabrielov theorem, and he proved, uh, he proved using model theoretic techniques that the complement of sub-exponential is sub-exponential. Okay. And uh, in the analytic case, it's kind of clear that the, the globally sub-analytic have only finitely many uh, connected components. And so uh, this makes the proof. Here, this is uh, absolutely non-trivial that uh, the sub-exponential uh, finitely many connected component, but uh, this is a classical result of Hovansky. So uh, exponential sets, and so also sub-exponential exponential sets, have finitely many finitely many components. Right? You look at this kind of equation; uh, this is far from trivial. Uh, okay. So, uh, as I said, uh, I should write that uh, nowadays, in fact, uh, you don't need model theory at all to prove these results. So, uh, uh, you can uh, look at a paper by Lyon and Rollin where uh, they have some kind of, uh, what the, ah, sorry, there is only one L, uh, uh, preparation theorem, what they call preparation theorem. Uh, for uh, log exponential functions and the same in the analytic case. Uh, so this is purely, everything now is completely uh, geometric. Uh, example four, and this is the one I will use uh, later in the course, is uh, usually if you take two O-minimal structure, then the structure generated by those, those two is certainly not O-minimal. But uh, in this particular case, uh, this is true. So you can uh, take the structure generated by uh, all, uh, um, uh, uh, all restricted analytic functions and the real exponential, and this is still O minimal. So here, the Hovansky was, was uh, that geometric, he didn't use model theory. No, this is purely geometric. So the model theory was here in this proof. And this is removed uh, by some uh, geometric preparation theorem that gives you an explicit kind of parametrization for uh, those sets. I don't want to enter this at all, first, because I didn't read in detail. And uh, OK, so, uh, so I've given the definition of omino structures. And I've claimed that there are many of them. 
And of course, what is remarkable and interesting for algebraic geometers is this appearance of uh, the exponential that uh, usually algebraic geometry does not consider. But notice that this is only the real exponential. Of course, you cannot put the complex exponential because otherwise the sine and the cosine would be. So this is really real geometry. OK, so uh, now uh, what I want to do is to uh, talk ab about, uh, just say a word about globalization. It's nice to work in Rn, but it's better to. Uh... So here they will use the standard real numbers. You said before you can use any real closed field. Here I am doing the standard real numbers. I, it was just a remark of, uh, and as I said, I would not use it. <laughs> But the logicians can do things with... Uh, yeah, of course, logicians are much more powerful. There's I know that about that. A question. <coughs> is the uh, Tarski theorem used implicitly or uh, not? No. Well, it's, I don't know how to answer this question. It's not true that those uh, structures have uh, quantifi quantifiers elimination, if this is your question. OK, so globalization, well, it's just the usual business. You construct uh, manifold or spaces out of gluing. But what is important is that you keep the finiteness. So you, you want atlas of charts with only finitely many charts. So uh, an S-definable uh, topological space or manifold M is a topological space M endowed with a finite uh, atlas of charts uh, phi i from vi to, so vi is in uh, M uh, to ui open in Rn uh, such that Well, it's defined uh, equidimensional stuff, so n is fixed one for all. Uh, such that uh, uh, one uh, for all ij, uh, ui, and uij, uh, which by definition is phi i of ui intersected with uj, uh, um, uh, are definable. So you want the, uh, your charts to be definable. And the change of coordinates uh, is definable. So for all uh, phi ij from, uh, so by definition, this is phi i composed with phi j minus 1. So this goes from uh, uij. Ah, OK, the way I did it, you have to take phi j, sorry. From uh, uij to uji um, uh, are definable. OK? So this gives you a notion of, uh, and of course, if you want a manifold, you have uh, to be sure that uh, those uh, change of coordinates are C0 or CP, if you want to have CP differentiability. Uh, and then uh, what is a morphism? A morphism uh, F from M to M prime uh, of S definable space is, uh, let's say, is uh, continuous. Uh, definable, a continuous map, definable in the charts. Let me not write. Right, so you look at everything in your finite collection of charts on M and M prime, and everything is definable. So you get a nice category uh, of S topological spaces, or uh, if you want S manifold, but I, I guess S topological spaces is enough for what I want to say right now. Okay. So of course, uh, what are the important examples? Important examples. Uh, uh, you start with X and algebraic uh, variety over R. Then uh, you can equip X of R with uh, its Euclidean topology. But uh, it gives you also uh, an R-alge manifold. 
right? You cover x by finitely many affine charts, and then those realizations give you uh, those charts there that you want when you take the R point. So this is a, a naturally an R algebra manifold. Uh, likewise, and this is the case I will be interested in, is uh, x of a C uh, algebraic. It's smooth algebraic variety, though. Well, you can do it without any assumption on smooth. Here, I didn't, I didn't ask things to be smooth. But you said open in RM. Okay, uh, I don't have to put it. In fact, uh, I just want uh, 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 a Homeo, if you want, here. I can also do it. But anyway, uh, with all the stratification business that I've explained to you, you will see that uh, this is no problem. So you can do uh, it also for x of c. Well, you just, for instance, uh, proceed by extension of uh, restriction of scalar alve, Okay. And so you see that if you want, you have algebraic varieties of a, a c, and then uh, you have uh, s uh, topological spaces. So you can call this uh, a definability uh, functor. And then here you have the usual realization in top topological spaces, if you want. And here this map factorizes. Uh. Okay. All right, so this finishes what I wanted to say uh, about uh, time uh, geometry. I'm very late, as usual. And so now I want to uh, kind of survey what I want to talk about in the course. So uh, two uh, applications to, uh, let's say, algebraic geometry and, uh, in particular, and arch theory. So when I say algebraic geometry, this is of course of a C. Uh, so why should a, a complex algebraic geometer care about this kind of business? Uh, well, let me start as a motivation first because uh, so we see that, uh, at least if I think of the C points, uh, there are, uh, you get definable topological space in an O-minimal structure for free. Um, and so, uh, but this is a much uh, larger class, right? So you can hope to try to uh, uh, work with spaces which are uh, almost algebraic, but not really. And this is, uh, and to prove algebraization results. So this is the first motivation. So uh, there are two algebraization, uh, two main algebraization results. Uh, one I will not talk about uh, today and tomorrow. I will just uh, mention it here, state it. But it will be very important uh, next week. Is uh, Diophantine criterion. So uh, Diophantine geometry usually you start with an algebraic variety defined over number fields, and you start you want to understand the q bar points. Let's say the q or the q bar points. Here you do the reverse, and uh, this means that. So this is a fantastic result by Pila and Wilkie that tells you the following. Suppose that you start uh, with a subset of Rn which is definable uh, in some minimal structure. So from now on, so let me write it for the last time in some minimal structure. And from now on, definable will always mean in some minimal structure. In some minimal structure. Then uh, you consider its algebraic part, you define it as being the union of all positive dimensional uh, semi algebraic sets of Z. Okay. And then uh, you would like to know uh, well, is it empty or not, for instance? And, uh, it's not so good because you can have a union of a point in the positive dimensional and uh, it's, you don't want to count the points. Yes, but uh, you know perfectly well the answer to this, right? I mean, pure, dim pure positive dimensional stuff. Okay. So, uh, uh, then, 
But uh, in some sense, you're right. I mean, uh, as I, I will say, I mean, uh, uh, a and a Bombieri and Pila proved the result uh, concerning curves, and then they needed 10 years to uh, see that the right generalization was uh, taking Z, this Z algebra. So you're right that uh, it's not completely obvious what you have to do uh, in terms of dimension. Uh, so what is the statement? The statement is that for any uh, epsilon larger than zero, there exists a constant depending only on epsilon and z, such that uh, uh, if you look at the set of points which are not in, the, in the algebraic part, and then you intersect them with q to the n. So now I'm using the rational nature of rational structure underlying Rn. And I want to count those points. So what I do, I take the naive height of those points. There are points in QN, so I can take their naive heights. And uh, the claim is that if you count such points, then you have very few. You have very few. Uh, this is smaller than C epsilon uh, T to the power epsilon. So this grows uh, in the height uh, sub-polynomially. Okay, so in other words, if you have a definable set in Rn in some mineral structure, and when you count the rational points, then uh, they grow in the height, at least polynomially, then you know that you have a semi-algebraic positive dimension component there. Okay, so this is an incredible uh, result. Let me uh, uh, make a picture. So the simplest case is just, you take your favorite box 0, 1, 0, 1, and you take a real analytic curve here. So C is real analytic. Now you count the points on that curve which are in Q square. And you count them with respect uh, to uh, the height. And if you have polynomially many, then your curve is real algebraic. Okay? So this is really a very strong uh, statement. And uh, we'll see next week that uh, this is crucial for studying uh, functional transcendence uh, properties in Hodge theory. So these are uh, actual type statement and then uh, a typical intersection. But uh, today this is not what I want to talk about. So what I want to talk about has to do with complex geometry. So uh, complex analysis, if you want. Uh, and the motto is that, so let me not write it. The motto is that uh, uh, the pathologies of complex analysis are not compatible with O-minimality. OK, this is really the motto. So let me illustrate this in dimension one. So uh, this is the following lemma, I think, which is kind of clear. So let f from uh, a punctured unit disk delta star to c be a holomorphic map, uh, which is also definable. So by this I mean that uh, the, I look at the underlying real structure, so C is definable and this guy is semi-algebraic. Uh, definable in some amino structure again, then uh, of course you ask what kind of singularities can you have at zero, and the answer is that then zero is not an essential singularity. In other words, uh, you are meromorphic at zero. Okay. And the proof is uh, nice, this is easy, modulo the great Picard theorem. Otherwise, if uh, you have an essential singularity, then by the great Picard theorem, you can consider the graph of uh, your function, and you take the closure, and then you know that in the, uh, when you remove the graph, then you will get uh, the vertical C. Right? This is the content of great Picard theorem. But then uh, you get a contradiction because uh, the dimension then of the real dimension now uh, of this thing is the dimension of at least uh, two. So this is two. And this is dimension of gamma of f. So this is a contradiction to uh, the definability. Contradiction to definability in some minimal structure. Okay. So exponential one over z is not different. Sorry? Sorry? Exponential is definable. No, real exponential is definable. Complex will never. So this is in dimension one. So uh, what can you get in higher dimension? So this is uh, what I will use uh, later. 
in higher dimension, then uh, let me recall the classical result in complex analysis due to Remert and Stein. So uh, the problem is extending uh, complex analytic subsets. So you start with S a complex manifold. You can think that this is C to the n. This is not very important. This is, and then you remove some closed uh, complex analytic set. Okay, and so now you suppose that this in in this uh, open thing, you have uh, uh, X, uh, which is a C analytic irreducible. Uh, um, uh, subset, okay, uh, enclosed in this complement. Then the question is, what happens when you take the closure, right? Then, of course, in usual uh, complex analytic geometry, the, the closure has no nice geometric structure. It's really disgusting. Uh, um, but uh, the theorem of Remert and Stein tells you that under some kind of tameless assumption, namely under this just dimension condition, if C, uh, uh, if X is sufficiently big, in other words, if the dimension of X is larger than uh, the dimension of E, then uh, when you take the closure, then the complex analytic structure propagates. Uh, then uh, X bar uh, is closed inside S and is closed uh, and C analytic. And of same dimension, of course. Okay. Okay. So uh, you this, uh, you can use this kind of uh, statement, for instance, to prove uh, Chow theorem. Of course, uh, this is overkilling. But uh, so now, uh, what is the corresponding O minimal statement? Well, so I don't know if you read it. Uh, this is kind of disgusting. This. So uh, there is an O minimal version due to Petersen and Sarchenko. So now uh, what you add as a hypothesis is that this guy uh, uh, is uh, definable in the sense that I uh, uh, stated before. You don't make any assumption on E, uh, but you assume that this guy is also definable. And then you erase this. And then you have the same statement. So now we can work with any dimension, but uh, the strong assumption is that, of course, you need an ambient definable uh, space and that the subthing is uh, definable. You mean definable globally, not just locally? Like definable in some amino structure globally, of course. Yeah, but before the assumption was local, it's analytic, it's very different. Yeah, I agree. It's, I'm not saying that it implies it, but it's similar in spirit. But we know already the closures are. Uh, no, you know nothing. Are definable. Why? Because you you said before the general thing for. Many yes, years. I agree. But uh, is, there is no reason. Even if the closure is definable, why should it be complex analytic? Mm. Ah, okay. That's 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 but we need to ask uh, S to be smooth. So. Sorry. Yeah. Here I'm using. I'm asking smooth. Uh, I don't think this is really very important. But. Uh, uh, so the corollary of this is uh, still by Petersen and Starchenko uh, is uh, a version of Chow theorem, O minimal Chow, which is really nice because you can get rid of the assumption, the usual assumption of projectivity. So suppose that you have uh, X, which is closed uh, and is C analytic and now definable in uh, S n, where S is quasi projective. Quasi projective, you just have to think that S is A and C. Okay? So uh, this guy is just C to the N, and you take any complex analytic subset of C to the N, which is uh, definable in some O minimal structure. And then the claim is that uh, X is algebraic. Right. The important point is that you see, I mean, if S is compact, if SN is compact, uh, uh, if you are in the projective case, then uh, anyway, this guy is automatically definable in RN. So this is, uh, and this is classical Chow. But here, what is important is that you can have a, a version of Chow in something which is only quasi-projective if you control how tame it is at infinity. And this is exactly what this definability assumption makes for you. OK. And uh, I'm so late. That's crazy. Um, so 
So I can give you an idea of the uh, a proof, in fact. So I'm cheating. There is a proof using only uh, O-minimality, basically. Uh, a bit of complex analysis, but not much. And there is a proof where you use uh, much more serious complex analysis. So I will give this proof. The other one is uh, longer. So uh, proof of the theorem. Uh, locally, so it's a rough idea. It's not a detailed proof. So this is to prevent a offer to complain. Uh, so locally, so you look at the theorem. Locally, you have uh, x in uh, s uh, minus uh, e. And you can assume that s locally is open in Cn. OK? I'm working with a manifold. Then uh, uh, what you do is that you can assume also that x is pure dimensional. Uh, x uh, pure dimensional of dimension over C and K. Now, uh, as x is definable, I apply uh, the corollaries that I had from the decomposition theorem and the certification theorem is that uh, the 2K Euclidean volume in my open set in C to the N uh, uh, is finite. Okay, And then you apply Bishop theorem. Thanks so far. <laughs> no, this is a remarkable uh, result. So Bishop theorem tells you that in this situation, you have something complex analytic whose Euclidean volume stays bounded. Then when you take the closure, it's still complex analytic. OK, and then to conclude, of course, it's important that you have only finitely many uh, analytic shots. OK, so uh, ah, I arrive at what I wanted to talk about, namely Hodge theory. OK, so, so in some sense, those results tell you that the first use that you can have for uh, 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 minimality in complex algebraic geometry are some kind of algebraization theorem, which are really nice. But in some sense, I want to argue uh, that uh, Hodge theory is really at the border of algebraic geometry in the sense that naturally it produces transcendental objects, which are not inside algebraic uh, world, and that tame geometry, to some extent, can uh, deal with them. OK? So uh, more fundamentally, so what is the kind of uh, transcendental objects that I have in mind? Well, these are objects which are constructed with uh, algebraic recipe in some, to some extent. And nevertheless, they are not true algebraic varieties. So uh, more fundamentally, uh, some transcendental objects, so they exist some quasi-algebraic uh, transcendental objects produced by algebraic geometry. So I will come to periods. But uh, uh, let's start with something much simpler. right? So if you start with a, an algebraic group, so this is a nice uh, real algebraic uh, variety. Okay? Then if you take the quotient, so you look at all the metrics, the space of Riemannian metrics that you can put on Rn. So this is this quotient. So this is a naturally uh, 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 semi-algebraic space. OK, but now uh, what is important is you want to consider a quotient of that form. And you have the feeling when you define this that everything is algebraic, right? This guy comes from uh, polynomial equations. Uh, this guy is also algebraic, and uh, this guy, well, you are just taking this quotient. And this thing, of course, so for n is equal to 2, this is the usual modular curve, OK? But for n larger than 3, then this thing is not even complex analytic, and it has no real algebra natural real algebraic structure. So for n larger than 3, uh, not algebraic in any re reasonable sense, OK? And the claim is that algebraic geometry uh, naturally considers this kind of space. For instance, uh, the theory of automorphic forms is perfectly defined on this. So of course, this is the analytic side of the story. But uh, suppose that you want to study uh, Galois representations. Then it would be very nice to have that space to, have, to be a usual algebraic variety, such that you can take etal cohomology and then make some kind of Langlands correspondence, creating Galois representation in the etal cohomology of this. And one of the main problems of the Langlands program is that you have to go to groups such that analogous quotients uh, are complex algebraic varieties. But you cannot deal directly with SNNR, for instance. Okay? But uh, I don't want to, so this is a philosophical uh, remark. But uh, now what I want to explain is that Hodge theory uh, really produces uh, 
things of that kind. So are these pieces similar to write? Mm -hmm. So uh, as I will uh, explain, well, the first result that I will uh, need is that those guys have a canonical R H structure. They are not semi-algebraic, in the usual sense of semi-algebraic geometry. Uh, at least there is not canonically. So you see, the main point is that on this kind of spaces, you have all the echo correspondences, and you want them to be algebraic also in some sense. And I don't know, I don't know how to apply Nash theorem or orthogonality theorem or this kind of thing to prove that there is a real algebraic structure which is stable under uh, echo correspondences. Uh, so now let me make a, a short reminder on Hodge theory. So uh, what is a very, um, a Hodge, a Z Hodge structure? Vz of weight n. So this is just a finite rank uh, Z module such that uh, Vc admits, uh, when you tensorize, tensorize by, by C, admits a canonical decomposition uh, Vpq such that Vp plus Q is equal to n and Vqp is equal to Vpq bar. And uh, more uh, abstractly, uh, as explained by Deligne, you can think of this as being just a representation of uh, C star. So the restriction of scalar from C to R uh, to uh, GLVR. So uh, S of R is just C star. So you are looking at a representation of C star. Uh, on the complex point, this is a representation of C star cross C star, so this gives you a bi-graduation, and the fact that this is defined over R gives you this condition. Okay? So Hodge theory is basically just a study of such representation, such tori. Okay? Uh, so already here you see uh, what will be important is the tension between the underlying uh, Z structure and the hot structures, uh, the hot structure does not care about uh, uh, the Z uh, structure. It's something purely real. So uh, now what is the basic of uh, arch theory? Let's do it simple. So I will work only with uh, smooth projective varieties. Then it tells you that if you take the associated uh, topological space of X of C and you look at the Betty cohomology uh, of this, the so usual singular cohomology, uh, then this is a Z hot structure. Okay. Of weight n. Uh, the usual construction for this is uh, transcendental. It extends also to a compact Keller manifold. Uh, well, you use some uh, Keller metric on that guy, and you take the harmonic forms that decompose in PQ types, and you get your decomposition. So this is very transcendental. So of course, you can argue that you have a much better uh, construction in the algebraic case. Uh, as follows, so uh, you look at H n x of c top, you take the rational cohomology. So what I want to explain first is that in some sense Hodge theory is irrational and then that this is transcendent. So uh, here you have a Q structure on this uh, Betty cohomology. Then you use Durham theorem. So you know that this is the same thing as uh, looking at the complex analytic manifold and the complex analytic uh, Durham complex. Uh, X n on the analytic space. So the hyper cohomology uh, of that complex by Durham theorem is the same thing as your Betty cohomology. No, now you use Grothendieck theorem that tells you that uh, this is the same thing. So now suppose that X is defined over a smaller field K. Uh, so we can take the algebraic hyper cohomology. So this is uh, a K vector space. Okay. And uh, finally, uh, how do you construct the Hodge structure? Well, here, uh, what you can say is that uh, on this uh, complex, you have uh, the Hodge filtration, which is the filtration bet. So F, uh, by definition, uh, Fp is a complex omega point larger than P. So you filtered. Sorry? Yeah, the, I said Grothendieck, but. Uh, OK. Here, in that case, Gaga is enough. OK, OK, I am not, I was, sorry, I was thinking about the quasi project. OK, Gaga is enough. Sorry. Um, right, and here, uh, what happens is that uh, this complex is filtered. So you have an associated uh, spectral sequence which degenerates. This is the main content uh, of uh, Hodge theory. And then you get that this is isomorphic to uh, uh, 
uh, the direct sum for p plus q is equal to n of hq of uh, x over k uh, omega uh, p x over k and then you can sublice it. Okay. So uh, this is another way of uh, looking at this uh, 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 filtration. So now uh, let me uh, rewrite this. And I claim that, uh, why do I claim that all this? So it seems that we have a natural definition, algebraic definition of the Hodge filtration. And this is true to some extent, but uh, what is not true is the comparison, that the comparison is algebraic. So by this, so let me recall, uh, let me just write uh, the full commodity as being the H beta of X. So this is the direct sum of uh, all N. And then I, this is a Q vector space and I tensor it by C. So here, I will skip uh, this analytic world. So uh, I get uh, this period isomorphism with the Durham commodity. So this is a K vector space and K is my subfield of C. And then uh, I have this isomorphism, which is a Dolbo uh, isomorphism uh, with the Dolbo cohomology or the Hodge cohomology, depending on how you want to call this. It's just this direct sum over all n of these directions. And this is also defined over okay, okay. Now, uh, if you think a bit of those things, you can fix a basis of this vector space over Q and fix a basis of this k vector space of a k, right? So fixing basis, uh, we see that uh, omega is given, this uh, period isomorphism is just given by a very big matrix, is described by a very big matrix omega x in G L N C, right? Where n is the dimension of those spaces. Uh, which is the period matrix, which is just uh, uh, describing uh, the change of coordinates. Uh, and you can see in, see in, in the LNC, it's intrinsic, but not in GLNC, it's intrinsic in GLNK, GLNC mod GLNK mod uh, GLNQ. Yeah, but uh, I'm, I, right now I'm concentrating on the left side. I will go back to the right side uh, after that. Um, then, uh, then any z of a k inside x of a k, any uh, algebraic subvariety defines uh, what you can call the uh, Betty Durham uh, cycle. Well, Durham Betty, it's nicer. Right? There is a cycle class associating to any such z, a class here without tensoring by C, and a class there without tensoring by C. Okay? So this is what I call, uh, so this is a pair of uh, classes uh, in HB of X and H Durham of X mapped uh, one to the other. Uh, by uh, this pi, okay? And then uh, Grothendieck conjecture is that, uh, suppose that K is a number field. Uh, then uh, any Durham uh, Betty cycle is algebraic. In the sense that this is the cycle associated uh, this is a cohomological cycle, a uh, pair of cycles associated to an algebraic cycle uh, defined over K, okay? So uh, you see, I mean, the moral of this story, uh, what I mean is that first, Hodge theory is irrational in the sense that it does not preserve the field of coefficients. You have to tensor by C, and this irrationality, but on the other hand, this irrationality is controlled by algebraic data, okay? No day twist here. No, no, they have to be, but I don't want to write them. <laughs> That's right. I agree. I agree. I'm already very late, so if I put the day twist, I'm dead. Uh, 
And uh, you can be more precise, and this is where irrationality goes to transcendence, is that you can consider cycles not only on x, but on the powers of x. Okay? So uh, any cycle on x to the n uh, uh, gives the acunet uh, homogeneous polynomial Uh, relations uh, of degree n between uh, the coefficients of omega x. Okay, this is clear. You use QNET and then you write uh, you write uh, your uh, Durham Betty class uh, in the cohomology of this, and this gives you those things. And then uh, the Grothendieck period conjecture is that uh, uh, if k is a number field, again, then uh, the ideal uh, defining, you take your uh, matrix omega x, then this is just a point, uh, and you take the RC closure of a k, so now this is an algebraic subvariety of g and k, right? Uh, then the ideal uh, is generated by uh, the relations coming from algebraic cycle. So uh, the moral of all this is just to insist that Hodge theory that looks uh, algebraic of a C, I mean, this isomorphism is just linear, so nothing happens. But if you are a bit careful about the fields of definition, First, this is irrational, and even more than that, this is transcendent if you look at all cycles in powers, but this transcendence is constrained by some very uh, big conjectures. So here you take HB is the direct sum of all the direct sum of all. So the gradation is also a structure. Yes, that you uh, yes, book. yes, yes. In addition to yeah, I'm just going very fast, and of course, everything is wrong, but I guess you get the idea. So now if you work on the same picture, but with the Dolbo or the Hodge realization, then, uh, well, you get a similar kind of uh, 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 Hodge classes, similar kind of pictures. The Hodge classes are now the classes in HB uh, X with image in H doll X uh, RPP. So these are Q classes uh, with image in the uh, double cohomology RPP, and uh, uh, the analog of the uh, period conjecture is now the Hodge conjecture that um, uh, Hodge classes are algebraic. Okay, and uh, yeah, this is the same model. Uh, Hodge theory is transcendent, but this transcendence is constrained by algebraic data. So uh, let me. Uh, yes. And is it also for a finite type field over, over Q or only number field? So, uh, so here for Hodge, of course, uh, Hodge is for uh, any X over C. There is no. Uh, you don't need a base field. For the uh, Grothendieck period conjecture, uh, the original version of Grothendieck is over a number field. There is a version uh, by André. Uh, for finitely generated fields, which is not as precise as this. It's an you get an inequality, and I don't want uh, to enter this. So uh, let me be more precise. What are the algebraic objects, in some sense, that should control this uh, transcendence phenomena? Well, let's do it at the Hodge level. So if you take uh, Q Hodge structure of weight n, you can associate to it uh, uh, given by a representation of S to GLVR, you can associate to it uh, uh, an algebraic group of a Q, and this is the, al the important algebraic invariant. So the Mumforte group of V, by definition, this is you take the image uh, of S and you take the Zariski closure of a Q. So this is a Q subgroup of uh, GLVQ. And uh, another way of seeing it is that you can show that this is a stabilizer of uh, in GLVQ of all Hodge tenses. In uh, uh, all tensor power of V and it's dual. 
And if you prefer, this is also the Tanaka group of this uh, tank and category, which is a category of sub pure hot structures uh, generated by V and its zero. Okay. Depending on your taste. And then uh, let me uh, mention the last conjecture in some sense, because I think this is the one that explains the best uh, the link between uh, the transcendence and the fact that this transcendence is constrained by algebraic data. So the conjecture, which is uh, you take uh, grothendieck piet conjecture plus mumford tate conjecture, uh, it tells you that if you work over a number field, then uh, if you look at the transcendence degree of a Q of uh, the field of the definition of a K of uh, your uh, period matrix, then this is the same thing as the dimension of the mumford tate group of H beta of X. So, uh, of course, you have uh, some transcendence, but you control it. Uh, of course, uh, those uh, conjectures are extremely difficult, and uh, they are number theoretic by essence, so there is no hope to touch them uh, using minimal methods. But I wanted to insist, because I think this is really what is uh, behind all these kind of transcendence results that you want to prove uh, uh, using Hodge theory, is that in some sense you look at uh, uh, the uh, functional analog of this kind of thing. So what does it mean? This means that you have to move uh, to the case where you do not consider a single algebraic variety, but a family of them. Okay? So, uh, so this is what I want to do now and uh, state the result. So now I start with uh, x over s, uh, smooth proper, or smooth projective, if you want, uh, morphism, where S is quasi-projective and uh, smooth. So everything is of a C, as usual. Then you globalize the situation, you look at the hot structures on the fiber. So you get the notion of variation of hot structure. So uh, you look first as a local uh, system of Z module, of the S n. Then you have a corresponding holomorphic vector bundle. Uh, so this is V, Z, um, tensor of a Z S n O S n. So uh, at the fiber, this is the commodity of the fiber with coefficient in Z in degree n, and so uh, 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 you get a Hodge filtration of V. Tiny question on, on because you go fast on many conjectures, but uh, so you had the period conjecture relative to the Deram realization, then yes. you have the Hodge conjecture, yes. and the Hodge conjecture shows that the the Hodge tensors are the, coming from cycles. Yes. So, but then you said the conjecture is period plus Mumford. Did you really? Yeah, it's not very precise. It's, it's probably period plus Hodge plus Mumford eight, right? I mean, what you want to pr put here is really uh, uh, the uh, motivic Galois group. So, if you just know the period and the Hodge, let us say for this setup. Does it imply this conjecture, or you need extra? Mm -hmm. No, you need. I think you need extra. You, you uh, no, 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 that's okay. Yeah, you're right. Maybe I, okay, I don't know. No, you're right. I should rather put Hodge here. That, uh, sorry. No, you're perfectly right. So I have the Hodge filtration, and why is it important to work with the filtration rather than the Hodge composition? Is that because it varies holomorphically. So FV uh, is, is a holomorphic sub bundle of V. And then I have the flat connection Nabla. So this is the datum of uh, a variation of hot structure. And you have uh, some uh, condition that is that uh, there is some relation between this holomorphic uh, filtration uh, and uh, your flat connection. Namely, uh, uh, it shifts the filtration uh, only by one. OK. So uh, in fact, uh, this gadget, if you forget about this geometric uh, pro uh, origin, is the definition of what is a variation of a structure. And uh, uh, the remark is that, uh, I will not write it, everything is algebraic, in fact, in this picture. Even if you give yourself on a smooth quasi projective variety, just a variation of a structure not coming from geometry, then Griffiths proved that uh, 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 everything is algebraic. In other words, the holomorphic vector bundle is, uh, can be algebraized. 
uh, the Arch filtration 2 and uh, uh, NABLA 2 in essentially a unique way. If you insist that NABLA is regular. So you do the delaying extension? You do the delaying extension, so this gives you the, the extension of V. Then you have to prove that F also extends. Uh, this is the work uh, of Griffiths. And uh, for NABLA, uh, by delaying extension, you know that there is a unique extension, which is algebraic, if you insist that it is regular. OK, so now uh, what I claim is that uh, the transcendence that we have seen over uh, number fields, uh, you see it over C if you work over the families. So what does it mean? This means the following, that uh, uh, you, here you have S and then you can take its universal cover. Then you have your holomorphic vector bundle uh, V. Then if you take the pullback to uh, the universal cover, well, here you have a flat connection, but it is trivialized because this guy is simply connected. So this implies that uh, V is canonically trivialized as being S tilde N cross uh, some complex uh, vector space VC where uh, you have uh, this structure. So you can identify it either with the fiber of uh, your local system or better with the H0 of uh, S N. So I, I can ask one question. So the, the fact that the whole filtration extends, you want it to extend as a sub bundle or a sub sheet? It extends as a sub bundle. Okay. And this is the result of variation of this is a result in, uh, this is a result of uh, Griffiths, of variation of our structure. It is proven in the paper by Schmidt, but uh, Schmidt says that this is due to Griffiths. Okay. So OK, so now uh, what, the, what transcendence I'm, t I'm talking about? Well, you put this uh, comparison uh, isomorphism in family. So this means that you start from your universal cover, right? And you uh, think of uh, your uh, filtration as living on that space. So this means that to a point uh, S tilde here, you associate the filtration uh, F on V S tilde. And you think of it as being the period matrix with respect to VZ. And so uh, you arrive in some flag variety, GC mod P. And uh, uh, I did not talk about an important point, which is uh, the uh, polarizability of the hot structure. So it will be assumed everywhere. And so in fact, you arrive in some open uh, subset, which is an, uh, an open uh, G of R orbit. And M is compact. Right, so uh, this map is just a map classifying uh, the hot filtration with respect to uh, the flat trivialization on the universal cover. But now everything is equivalent under the action of uh, pi 1. And so you get uh, exactly one of the spaces I was talking about uh, before, namely uh, G of R mod M mod gamma. So this is the definition. So this is a period map. So giving yourself a variation of a structure or giving yourself a period map is exactly the same thing. So what are the properties? Well, this map is holomorphic because the Hodge filtration varies holomorphically. And uh, there is a condition coming from uh, this condition. So it is horizontal. I don't want to enter into the details. I will do that uh, tomorrow. OK. Uh, so uh, what is, and gamma is an arithmetic group in G of Q. So what is G? G is the generic Mumford tape group uh, 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 of a fiber of your variation. And gamma in G of Q, an arithmetic group. OK. So uh, what is the basic fact that illustrates uh, this transcendence I was talking about? Well, the basic fact is that uh, usually, so fact is that, uh, in general, uh, as soon as uh, V does not come by some tensor construction from weight 1, So I'm not very precise here, but uh, in, the, in, in the very general case, if you take randomly a variation of a structure, if you do not have a family of abelian varieties, say, uh, 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 then S gamma G M is uh, the complex space, complex manifold S gamma G M has no algebraic structure. So you see that even starting with a very algebraic situation, 
if you encode uh, uh, your uh, variation of a structure by a period map, where implicitly you are using this period uh, isomorphism, then uh, you get some transcendental object. First, that quotient, and then the map, which is transcendental. Okay. So uh, now uh, let me uh, state uh, the results. I have five minutes. That's, that should be enough. Uh, let's see this here. Now maybe I will. I will keep this here right now. And there is here. So what is the first theorem that I want to explain uh, tomorrow? So this is due to uh, Ben Baker, uh, myself, and uh, Jacob Zimmerman. So uh, it should appear soon. It will appear soon. Uh, so uh, is to say that, OK, you created uh, uh, some complex analytic guy, uh, which is uh, not algebraic, this is S gamma GM, but ne nevertheless. Uh, they have some nice tame uh, geometry, tameness of arithmetic quotients. Is that, and this is pure group, group theory. It has nothing to do with Hodge theory. So you take a reductive algebraic group of a Q, and you take M in G of R, a compact subgroup, and you take gamma in G of Q, an arithmetic group. So this is what I call. Uh, S gamma GM is called an arithmetic quotient. So S gamma GM, this double quotient there, uh, has a natural uh, R-alg uh, definable structure. And more precisely, there exists a fundamental set uh, in G mod M. So G mod M is always uh, semi-algebraic. So there is a semi-algebraic fundamental set Uh, for gamma, such that the projection from uh, this fundamental set to S gamma GM is uh, R-alg definable. So the full map cannot be definable because it is periodic under the action of gamma. But if you restrict yourself to a fundamental set, then it becomes definable. And then two is that uh, this is functorial in the sense that any uh, uh, morphism S gamma prime G prime M prime to uh, S gamma G M of arithmetic quotients is definable. So a morphism of arithmetic quotients means that the morphism essentially comes from a group morphism from G prime to G following uh, what happens for M prime to M and gamma prime to gamma. I'm a bit vague here, but... Uh, yeah, I'm allowed to, to, to I'm allowed to change the base point. Uh, so I will I will make that precise tomorrow, but it takes too much time to do it now. So. And the, the fundamental set means that it intersects only five in any Yes. And, and this condition is independent of the fundamental set. It is yes. uniquely characterizes and independent. It's uh, not uniquely, but uh, you will see that these are exactly Ziegel sets that I take. I take Ziegel sets. Or union of Ziegel sets. Ah, for, but you don't say that uh, once more, I mean, this is not a really, I agree with you that this is not a nice statement. It sh I should be more precise about, there is an explicit, let's say there is an explicit construction of an F semi-algebraic such that this map is definable in our algebra. Okay? So uh, what is the theorem two? Uh, still by uh, Baker, uh, uh, myself, and Zimmerman. Is that uh, tameness of period map. OK, uh, those guys are wild. They are complex analytic. But now we have proved that the target is tame. And the result is that uh, if you start with any variation of a structure, polarizable, where S is quasi-projective, over S quasi-projective, then uh, the period map phi S from S n to uh, S gamma G m. So of course, uh, this guy has a real algebraic structure. This guy has a uh, R-alg structure too. But this map is not uh, semi-algebraic. But it's still definable 
in R and X. I think this is the main result in that paper. This means that to write that map in uh, nice charts, you need only to use restricted analytic function and the real exponential. Nothing else. Okay, so it is tame uh, for this respect to this uh, O minimal structure. So S, is, uh, S is smooth quasi projective. Yeah, I just wrote Q QP smooth. Let's see. Uh, Am I allowed to take five more minutes, or is it strictly forbidden by them? This is okay? Well, you mean I'm already over? Or? <laughs> ah, good. Um, okay, so uh, I think I like this result because conceptually you understand uh, the tameness of the geometry. It has, an, it has a nice application, application to Hodge Locke. So uh, you want to detect uh, the points in S where you have exceptional Hodge classes. So uh, let's define this set, a set uh, of closed points such that there exists an exceptional Hodge classes, Hodge tensors uh, in Vs, for Vs. So there is, in some tensor power of the fiber at S, uh, there is some exceptional Hodge classes that appear in that fiber, which, which does not exist on the nearby uh, fibers. Uh, then uh, you can also say that this is a set of points such that uh, the Mumforte group of Vs is not of maximal dimension. Okay. So now you can interpret, uh, you want to understand the geometry of that Loki. So uh, the remark is that and this was done by Vail in 79, is that if you are in the geometric situation, in the geometric case, uh, as the Hodge conjecture implies that this is a count, that this locus is a countable union. Uh, of uh, algebraic subvarieties of S. The reason is that uh, each time you see an exceptional Hodge class, this means that there is an algebraic cycle appearing. But algebraic cycles have these nice properties that they glue together uh, just because of the existence of uh, Hilbert schemes. And so uh, the locus in the total space should correspond to uh, a family of algebraic cycles. So when you project it, you would get something uh, algebraic two. This is roughly uh, the idea. So, and so the question of Vail, uh, can you prove this without assuming the Hodge conjecture? Uh, so now, in terms of uh, the period map, you see that uh, this Hodge locus inside S n is given uh, it comes from the period map as follows. This is the pre-image of uh, uh, the uh, union for all morphism of Hodge data, so G prime to G and some element G and G Q, of uh, spaces of the same kind. Right, so you have your big space S gamma GM, and inside those ones you have a collection of spaces looking very much like them, like it, uh, namely those S gamma prime, G prime, M prime. And uh, you see that uh, this Hodge locus is the pre image of that thing. And so uh, the, the corollary of the theorem well, the theorem tells you that this guy is definable, and uh, the second part of the theorem one tells you that those guys seen as subvarieties here are definable subvarieties. So now uh, the period map uh, is definable. So when you pull back one of those guys, you get some guy which is definable here. And because the map is complex analytic, and this is a complex analytic submanifold, then uh, the preimage of each of those guys is a complex analytic and definable. Now you, have, you apply Petersil Starchenko uh, result. This is algebraic, and you're done. And you know that the map from S gamma prime G prime M prime to S gamma GM is essentially a subvariety of it? Yeah, it's essentially a subvariety. But uh, yeah, there is some properness to be, of course, to be taken into account. Yeah. And also finiteness of five. Okay. Yes. So uh, so what you prove corollary of uh, theorem two is uh, a fame. You reprove a famous theorem of uh, Catania de Kaplan. 
with the bitless uh, computations and, uh, in the paper, namely that uh, HL of S is a countable union of algebraic subvarieties. And uh, without any assumption on the geometricity of the, hot uh, the variation of hot structure. Uh, what? Polar everything is polarizable. Uh, uh, yeah, so now I extend really for, uh, can I extend for five minutes? <laughs> uh, so uh, what is another result uh, which you can prove using this uh, result uh, is uh, image of period maps. So you see, ah, I just erase it. You have this period map uh, phi from the analytic space SN to that guy. And the question is, is there any nice structure on the image? Well, the first remark of Griffiths is that you can always, extending a bit SN, assume that this map is proper. So the image will always be complex analytic. But the question is, can you really put a complex algebraic structure on the image? And uh, this is non-trivial. In fact, this is kind of not so difficult if the image is normal. But a priori, there is no reason why it should be. And uh, so uh, you get this theorem of uh, Baker, uh, Brune Barbe, and Jacob uh, and Timmerman, uh, which is a conjecture, which was a long uh, time uh, conjecture of Griffiths. That says that, well, maybe let's try to be precise. Let phi from S n uh, to S gamma gm a period map for a polarizable vari pure variation of a structure. Uh, then there exists a unique uh, quasi projective variety z and a morphism g from uh, S to Z dominant, uh, such that, uh, uh, oh, such that, so that you have the diagram that you imagine, such that uh, S N. Uh, uh, you have the identification of your algebraic morphism Z n, then you have a closed uh, analytic immersion, so closed uh, immersion, and in fact definable also, uh, S gamma G m. This, this, I said that, but uh, I was too fast. Uh, Griffiths showed a long time ago that you can always, removing the, the boundaries, the components of the boundaries, you take a normal crossing compactification, you remove the component of the boundary, where the local monodromy is trivial. You can extend, you can extend through those ones, and then the map phi becomes proper. And so you know that the image is complex analytic. But your problem is algebraize this. And uh, so this result of Baker, uh, Brun Barbe, and Zimmerman, it uses crucially uh, theorem two, plus uh, the developer general uh, Gaga formalism, extending the uh, ominimal chow of uh, Petersen and Sarchenko. And uh, to finish, uh, let me state uh, last result. Yeah, yeah. So I want to talk about those results, theorem one, two, and uh, maybe I should take, uh, tell, I forgot to write three. I will try to talk about this in more detail tomorrow. And then uh, the last theorem that I want to mention uh, now, I will talk uh, about it, I think, the last uh, Wednesday uh, in one week. So uh, you have one more result, which is a typical intersection statement. I will explain uh, next week what it means. Uh, this is typical against uh, atypical. So uh, theorem four, uh, due to uh, myself and uh, Anna Odinovska, states the following, so that uh, if you have V to S uh, polarized, uh, the variation of our structure, uh, assume, so I will make an assumption for simplicity that the generic Montfortet group the adjoint group of uh, that guy is simple. 
I don't want to have a product situation. I have a result in general, but uh, it's more complicated to state. And then the question is, uh, can you say more about the geometry of the Hodge locus? You know that the Hodge locus will be a countable union of algebraic subvarieties. But for instance, you can ask, what is the Zariski closure of this thing? And then the result is kind of surprising to me is that then either this Hodge locus, OK, I cannot touch points. This Hodge locus is a countable union of algebraic varieties of various dimension. I keep only. Uh, the positive dimensional part. More precisely, what is mapped to some uh, uh, positive dimensional stuff in the period domain. Then uh, the claim is that uh, this guy, which a priori is a countable union, is in fact either a finite union, so it is algebraic on the nose of special subvarieties, in particular, uh, it is algebraic, or it is dense. There is no intermediate uh, nice geometry that you can consider. So uh, to really conclude, let me uh, give an example. Classical one, take an algebraic subvariety of AG, uh, modular space of principally polarized bin variety. And then the claim is that either S contains only finitely many positive dimensional varieties reducible ones contained in uh, special subvarieties of AG and maximal for this property or uh, the union of such varieties is dense. Is that in S? Okay, so, sorry. Uh, assume S or generic. Thanks. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm late. Uh, I stop here for today. that the weight is not one. Yes. Uh, well, it's just because, uh, well, I'm not making an assumption. I'm just saying that uh, when the weight is equal to one, then uh, this is a connected Chimura variety. And it was known for a long time that uh, this, I should, I should mention that this map is already algebraic. So this is an old theorem of Borel. Of course, we reproved it uh, en passant, but uh, it's not the same proof, by the way. In some sense, uh, Borel used hyperbolicity properties. Uh, in some sense, in our proof, we also use some hyperbolicity properties, but uh, it's not exactly in the same way. And here in the same way, again, it doesn't look, it looks like some precision because a special sub variety of AG, you mean the proper special sub variety? Yes, that's correct, proper. Uh, contained in proper. Yeah, there is always this ambiguity that the full space, of course, is proper. Is a is a special. Thanks. Yeah. So the plan is tomorrow. I want to discuss, uh, try to give some details about uh, those results. Then next Tuesday I will talk about something I did not talk at all uh, today, which is uh, really functional transcendence uh, statement for uh, this kind of period map, axial conjecture. And then uh, on the last day, I would try to give some applications to atypical intersections and typical intersections. So I didn't say anything about atypical intersections. This is typically Andre Hort or Zebra Pink type conjectures. And uh, a typical intersection is this one, because here you see that you do not put atypicality about the intersection. It is just a dimension question, which is not atypical. Okay. So that's the plan for those who plan to come. <laughs> <laughs>